Good afternoon. You are very welcome to this afternoon's webinar discussion on the future of US foreign policy hosted by the Institute of um, International and European Affairs. I'm Katrina Perry, RTE journalist, current 61 News anchor and former Washington correspondent. I'm delighted to be chairing this timely session, which comes just days after one of the most anticipated presidential elections in modern US history. And it's not over yet, as we all know. And um, we can see by the record turnout just how important it was for American voters as well. And it's being watched closely by the international community. And I don't think anyone who is even remotely interested in politics has been able to tear themselves away from the coverage or if you're like me, get more than a couple of hours of sleep snatched here and there all week. Um, and so while we all continue to keep a close eye on the remaining counts and how they're going and we wait to see who will be the next president of the United States, today we're going to take a step back and look at the broader geopolitical picture and consider just what the future holds for US foreign policy. Now, as we don't have a president elect just yet, we're going to look at the impact that either possible outcome will have. So whether that's a continuation of the policies of the Trump administration, with which, of course, we're all familiar, or what could be in store with a new Biden administration, which might be similar in many ways to the Obama administration, of which he was vice president. But of course, the world has moved on quite a lot in the past four years. Um, you know, under President Trump, we saw the US move away from international organizations like the UN, NATO, and most recently the WHO. We saw it withdraw from international agreements like the Paris Climate Accord and the Iran nuclear deal and a rocky relationship at times with the EU, while at the same time forging new relationships with countries that previous presidents had not welcomed. Case in point, of course, being Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And the approach taken by President Trump was outlined clearly, I think, in January 2018 in the National Defense Strategy document, which referred to interstate strategic competition, not terrorism, as the primary concern in US national security. And that the central challenge to the US prosperity and security was the re-emergence of long-term strategic competition and primarily from China and Russia. So we'll discuss that today, along with the relationship with the Middle East. And uh, we're delighted to be joined by a stellar lineup of experts from some of the United States top think tank think tanks and academic institutions. So let me briefly introduce our panelists for this afternoon's discussion. I'll do that in alphabetical order. So we have Dr. Michelle Dunn, who's the director and senior fellow of Carnegie Endowment's Middle East program, where her research focuses on economic and political change across the region. Michelle previously served as Middle East Specialist in the State Department from 1986 to 2003 under Republican and Democratic presidents, serving in the National Security Council, the Secretary's Policy Planning Staff, the US Embassy in Cairo and the US Consulate General in Jerusalem. We also have Dr. Elizabeth Economy, who's a senior fellow at Stanford University's Hoover Institution and a senior fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Elizabeth is an award-winning author of several books on Chinese domestic and foreign policy, including The Third Revolution, Xi Jinping and the New Chinese State, and By All Means Necessary, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. We're also joined by Dr. Angela Stent, who is the director of the Center for Eurasian, Russian and East European Studies and a professor of government and foreign service at Georgetown University. Angela also serves as non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and previously served in the Office of Policy Planning at the State Department. An acclaimed expert and author, her latest book is Putin's World, Russia Against the West and With the Rest. Now, before we begin uh, talking to our fantastic panelists there, let me just say that today's discussion is fully on the record and we'll begin with initial remarks from each speaker. We'll have a bit of discussion and then we'll get to the audience questions. Now, if you do have questions, please submit them using the Q&A function through Zoom there, which you should see on your screen. And you can see us, but we can't see you. So please do include your name and any affiliation you may have or who you're representing with your question. And you can also feel free to join in the discussion on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So without further ado, let's get going to you, Elizabeth, first. You're our China expert. 
And before we get to the future of US-China relations and the implications of the presidential election, could you talk us through how that relationship has evolved in recent years? And broadly speaking, the debates that are ongoing in US foreign policy circles about how China's rise may reshape the global order and how the US should manage that. Sure, thank you so much, Katrina. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be part of uh, such a stellar panel, um, particularly at this moment in time. Um, so happy to say a few words about um, how the US-China relation uh, has gotten to where it is today and where I think uh, the debates uh, right now, the most important debates uh, sit. So where we are, uh, frankly speaking, is in the most important period uh, of US-China relations since before normalization in 1979. Uh, in the United States, there is a widespread, although not uniformly held belief, uh, that China poses a systemic challenge, uh, that it is bent on advancing its system globally and undermining the liberal international order, that it is stealing a technology, uh, and that it wants to replace the US as the dominant power in East Asia. COVID-19 reinforced uh, a sense within the US that China could not be trusted, and it accelerated calls for reviewing supply chains and decoupling. In China, there is a widespread belief that the United States is bent on containing China, that it does not want China to succeed, and that this derives from a position of US weakness, not strength, and that ultimately China will triumph. So briefly, how do we get here? Uh, I think there are really three inflection points over the past uh, decade or a little bit more. Uh, the first was in 2008 and the global financial crisis. And that was a moment when I think uh, Chinese ambition to be on par with or even surpass the United States began to crystallize. You had Chinese officials talking about moving away from the dollar as the world's reserve currency. Um, you had uh, a sort of more um, assertive Chinese foreign policy with regard to the South China Sea. You had proposals uh, for a new relationship among major powers. Um, the second inflection point was really, and I think perhaps the most transformative, was the advent of Xi Jinping as the leader uh, of China in 2012. Uh, his policies have been uh, both more repressive and authoritarian at home uh, and more ambitious and expansive abroad. And this has had a transformative impact on how the U.S. understands China and the U.S.-China relationship. Overall, I would say the U.S. has become convinced that at least for the foreseeable future, China is not pursuing a policy of reform and opening, uh, that it's not committed to upholding the liberal international order, and thus that the U.S. policy of engagement, which is what has guided uh, the United States for probably four decades now, uh, is no longer uh, a policy that is uh, valid, that is workable. Uh, so just to give you a couple of examples of the policies that have contributed to the change in U.S. thinking. Uh, on the political front, I would point to significant new constraints on the internet and media in China. Uh, kicking out the journalists uh, from the major U.S. newspapers like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and the Wall Street Journal, the obvious and egregious human rights abuses uh, in Xinjiang, uh, the Hong Kong national security law, uh, and the law on the management of foreign NGOs, uh, which resulted in the number of foreign NGOs active in China uh, dropping from over 7,000 uh, before January 2017 to under 500 today. And that was significant because uh, the civil society and international NGOs in the United States were one of the sort of pillars of US support for a robust uh, and proactive and positive relationship with China. So by uh, cutting down uh, the sort of opportunities for interaction between US civil society and Chinese civil society, the Chinese government also uh, cut down on US support. Uh, on the economic front, I think we've seen little progress on the type of structural economic reform uh, that people in the US were uh, expecting in China. Uh, obviously, the Chinese Communist Party playing a much stronger role in private firms, especially technology firms. Uh, and that has had an important influence on US thinking with regard to companies like Huawei or TikTok or WeChat. Uh, there's a, a sense that there is no such thing as a private Chinese firm, that every Chinese firm must be responsive to any demand uh, by the Chinese government. Uh, programs like Made in China 2025 and Xi Jinping's new dual circulation theory also are understood in the U.S. as creating an uneven playing field for multinationals and have resulted in, again, a reduction of support from the U.S. business community for China. So you have two pillars of, of the U.S.-China relationship in the United States, uh, both suffering as a result of Chinese policies and thus uh, both resulting in a diminished uh, support for a proactive policy. And then finally, on the foreign policy front, we've seen a much more assertive uh, Chinese foreign policy around uh, sovereignty issues with regard to Taiwan, the South China Sea, uh, India border disputes, the Belt and Road Initiative, 
which the US sees as exporting poor labor, environmental and governance standards, as well as laying the groundwork for the spread of Chinese uh, technological and military influence. Uh, US has also become concerned about undue Chinese influence in the United Nations. And this was exemplified uh, by the World Health Organization's relatively slow response uh, to COVID-19. And there is a, a, a sort of significant narrative in the United States that uh, that resulted from Chinese influence. Uh, and then finally, uh, the US has become concerned about efforts to advance Chinese interests within the United States through uh, institutions like the uh, Confucius Institutes or the Thousand Talents Program, uh, intellectual property theft from universities and companies. And the third and final inflection point was the election of Donald Trump. Uh, and the Trump administration came in, it reassessed and it reset US policy. I characterize it as moving from a policy of engage uh, but hedge to an approach of compete, counter, and contain. Uh, the Trump administration uh, publicly identified China as a revisionist power and a strategic competitor uh, in its national security strategy, uh, as Katrina uh, alluded to in her opening remarks. I think um, it's important to understand the Trump administration policy as two different policies though. On the one hand, you have President Trump, his America first platform. Uh, he's not interested in multilateral arrangements or US leadership on the global stage. As Contrita mentioned, believes that allies and partners are more constraints on US power as opposed to enablers of US strength, uh, pursues a unilateral policy toward China focused on trade overwhelmingly, and secondarily, uh, North Korea. Uh, the administration, though, at, at a broader level, is much more internationalist and multilateral uh, than I think uh, many people give them credit for. Uh, and I think I would point to five priorities, uh, again, from the broader administration. First, uh, promotion of a free and open Indo-Pacific, strengthening ties among the Quad countries, Japan, India, uh, the US and Australia, and also trying to bring Europe into Asia, not just as an economic actor, but also to try to engage Europe uh, as a strategic player. Uh, second, limiting Chinese influence with the United, within the United States. So sort of pushing for the closure of those Confucius Institutes, you know, launching FBI and US Department uh, investigations uh, on IP theft and the Thousand Talents program. Uh, third, a suite of policies that are related to technology. Uh, this is a, a serious area of concern in the US. So developing an entities list, export controls, uh, the idea of a clean supply chain, um, a willingness to move toward decoupling of the two economies, all to try to protect uh, core uh, US uh, technologies uh, and also to prevent the United States from somehow inadvertently uh, contributing to China's uh, civil military fusion uh, effort. Uh, fourth, pushing back on the Belt and Road Initiative. I'm happy to talk about that more if people are interested. Uh, fifth, I would say calling out Chinese uh, human rights practices in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, sanctioning those responsible and elevating Taiwan uh, within the context of US policy in Asia. Uh, and then finally, uh, pushing back against Chinese influence in the United Nations. So even though the US isn't interested in leading in the UN at all, uh, we are interested uh, in preventing chi China from leading in the UN. So pushing back against uh, Chinese officials from assuming leadership positions in more UN agencies. If I were going to just characterize uh, the Trump administration policy toward China as a whole, I would say that it is uh, overwhelmingly reactive and defensive as opposed to proactive or offering an affirmative policy of US leadership. Uh, there's also no clear strategic objective. It is again about preventing China from gaining ground as opposed to looking out and trying to figure out where does the United States wanna be three or five or 10 years uh, and what do we want that US-China relationship to look like? So finally, um, as we enter the next uh, four years, what are sort of the significant debates underway in the United States? Uh, I'll just finish up with these quickly. I think first, um, there is a debate around to what extent China wants to supplant the United States. I think most people in the foreign policy community uh, agree that China wants the United States out of East Asia. Uh, there is a secondary debate uh, where there's uh, less consensus around whether China wants to replace the United States as the sole superpower. A uh, second is how high a fence and large a yard uh, do we wanna construct to protect US technology? Uh, right now, the administration finds a national security threat associated with virtually every technology, Chinese technology, uh, but there is significant pressure from the US business community to use a scalpel, uh, not a sledgehammer, and to you know, help preserve uh, some access to the Chinese market. Uh, third, what does it take to compete effectively with China? Uh, the current administration is about a robust foreign policy, building up the military, working with allies and partners uh, in the Asia Pacific to push back against China. 
I think in a democratic administration, there would be an equal focus uh, on uh, you know, strengthening in America at home. So returning to ideas about uh, what makes America great in terms of immigration and education and innovation. Uh, fourth, how do we best engage our allies and partners? I think you know, we've seen over the past four years that this is an administration that relies more on um, a little more of coercion, some bullying, um, a hard edged persuasion. Uh, whereas I think it's clear that a Biden administration uh, is uh, more prone to think uh, in terms of engagement and consultation. Uh, and then finally, uh, I think a big and outstanding question is, you know, should we attempt to find areas of common purpose and common ground with China? Um, some people uh, believe uh, that we have uh, no need uh, for such a thing, that uh, China poses an existential threat. Um, and I think uh, many other people, however, believe that there are areas such as climate change, the pandemic uh, proliferation, where it's critical uh, that the United States work with China, uh, and that indeed finding these areas of common ground are incredibly important for arresting the free fall uh, in the relationship. So I'll just conclude by saying, I think the biggest debate of all uh, is really whether the divisions that the United States and China are facing across values and security and economics will harden into some semblance of a cold war uh, or whether uh, we should be working uh, hard to arrest this process. Thanks very much. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, plenty to unpack there, which we will try and get to later on in the session. But for now, let's go to Michelle on Middle Eastern matters. And again, before we get to what four more years of President Trump might look like or a new Joe Biden administration, what that might mean for relations in the Middle East, could you begin by painting a picture for us of the current state of play? As we said earlier, we saw President Trump withdraw the US from the Iranian nuclear deal, moving of the embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, continuing instant in Syria and elsewhere. So how has President Trump's approach in the region differed to what we saw before that with the Obama administration? Thank you, Katrina. And thank you to the IIEA for inviting me to be part of this panel. Um, you know, what's interesting, Katrina, is I think that in, in some ways, you know, President Trump has pursued goals that, you know, in some ways have been declared U.S. goals for a long time, right? Preventing Iran from developing nuclear weapons, defeating terrorist groups such as the Islamic State, uh, helping regional allies defend themselves, supporting the security of Israel, fostering peace between Israel and Arab neighbors. But, you know, Trump has taken these things to an extreme. And, um, and he has pursued them in ways that I, I think that, that shocked Americans as well as the international community. I mean, in a very un, unilateralist style, uh, very transactional, you know, willing to apply a great deal of pressure without really regards to whether it's bringing results, I mean, for example, against Iran or consequences on, on people and appearing blind and deaf to the concerns of, um, of a lot of long-term allies in the region as well as sort of ordinary people in the region. Um, he was also cruder than, you know, Trump has been cruder than his predecessors in taking steps in the Middle East to serve domestic US political constituencies. And here I'm thinking particularly to evangelical Christians who are very large uh, voting bloc in the United States um, and, you know, steps that Trump took related to Israel to, to please them. Trump was al also has been cruder in favoring authoritarian leaders over citizens. I mean, let's be, let's be frank about this. I mean, foreign policy tends to be a government to government elite to elite thing. And it, it often tends to favor the rich and powerful over ordinary citizens. But again, Trump took this to an extreme. And I just want to speak about, you know, a couple of things that aren't often talked about. When people look at the Middle East, they're often looking at it as though it's a, a diplomatic chessboard with, you know, MBS and MBZ and, you know, all these leaders on it, which, you know, it is, but, but there are people there. And a, a number of the things that President Trump did really had a profound effect on people in the Middle East. So, for example, the so-called Muslim ban, this um, restricting access to the United States for people from Iran, Libya, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, uh, which uh, President Trump did. 
um, you know, really it, it blocked access to the United States for hundreds of thousands of people every year. Just to give you a sense of that, in 2016, more than 800,000 people from those five countries received non-immigrant or immigrant visas to come to the United States. By 2019, only 23,000 people did. Do you see, you know, what an enormous difference that is? Then there's refugee policy, which, you know, at a time when the Middle East has several wars going on, and obviously large flows of refugees have come from the Middle East toward Europe, um, Trump really cut access to the United States by for refugees. I mean, in in 2016, the United States accepted 110,000 refugees last year. The Obama presidency, Trump cut that steadily. 45,000 refugees in 2018, 18,000 in 2019, and a total of 15,000 for 2020. And by the way, we've accepted far less than that because of the pandemic. So, um, you know, and also Trump tilted the, the refugees that would be accepted toward Christians and away from Muslims. Historically, you know, over the past 20 years, the 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 percentage of refugees that the United States has accepted that have been Muslim have been about 40 about 40 percent uh, average over all those years. Uh, Trump cut that to to less than half, and he explicitly. Um, discriminated in favor of Christian refugees. So then there's lots of other things. There's the effect of the maximum pressure campaign against Iran, Iranian sanctions uh, on the Iranian people, as well as Trump overruling US congressional efforts to cut off weapons sales to Saudi Arabia for the war in Yemen, which has, you know, the war in Yemen has had horrific consequences. And by the way, that's not completely Trump's uh, fault. I mean, the United States started started supporting that war under President Obama. But at any rate, a, as as that war has gotten worse and worse, the U.S. Congress did want to cut off weapons to uh, to Saudi Arabia, and uh, Trump blocked that. Um, and then there's the whole issue of Israel and the Palestinians and the way President Trump really tilted U.S. policy. Let's face it, U.S. policy on the issue has always favored the interests of Israel. But as I said, Trump took it to an extreme. He really, you know, and took it to a way that has had real um, human rights consequences for Palestinians. Um, so, you know, it's really, it's really interesting, Katrina, by the way, if you look at... Um, in the Middle East, you know, we've been hearing that a lot of the leaders of the Middle East would really like to see President Trump reelected, right? Not every single one of them, but but many of them would much prefer they've developed close relations with Trump and they would like to see him reelected. Not so much the citizens. Um, a, a group called the Arab Barometer did some really interesting polling uh, before the U.S. elections in a, a group of Arab countries, at, among, and these are among ordinary citizens. They showed very low approval um, ratings of Trump and a huge preference for Biden to be elected. So you've got this, you know, sit leader citizen gap in the Middle East. And, um, you know, it, it, Trump, as I said, just tilted U.S. policy so much further towards the leaders, toward the powerful and, and towards authoritarian leaders. Katrina, I think you're muted. Thank you. Um, thank you for that, Michelle. And just to bring everyone a little bit of a news flash while we've been talking there, they've released another tranche of votes in Pennsylvania and Joe Biden has now moved ahead of Donald Trump. They're still counting, but the margin there is now 5,000. Uh, so on it goes, close as ever. Um, but Angela, let's move on and talk about Russia. I mean, that must be one of the frequently mentioned uh, foreign nations in this election campaign as it was in 2016. Can you set the scene for us in terms of how US-Russia relations have evolved in recent years? I know you contend that relations are currently at their worst point since the mm -hmm. mid 1980s. So you might talk us through maybe why that is, especially considering that Trump argues that he really wanted to mend US-Russia relations. Well, thank you. And I'm delighted to be part of this webcast. We're on a cliffhanger day, but you know, we'll, we'll wait. Um, so the current bad state of relations began in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea and it launched a war in Southeastern Ukraine. And I think we have to remember that this is a war in which 14,000 people have already died and it's not over. There are casualties practically every day. 
So at that point, of course, you had President Obama in office um, dealing uh, with President Putin. And of course, you had an agreement to throw Russia out of the uh, G8 and then sanctions uh, on Russia uh, because of what was happening in Ukraine and because the Russians refused to acknowledge anything that they were doing. So that was that's when it sort of began to deteriorate uh, quite markedly. And then, of course, we got 2016. So without rehearsing everything that happened there, we do know that the Russians intervened quite heavily in the 2016 election campaign. They wanted to get Donald Trump elected because Donald Trump said he wanted to do a deal with Russia. He didn't see why we had to have bad relations with Russia. He sort of intimated that Ukraine was really part of Russia. People in his family and, and, and people in his businesses met with different Russians. Um, and then, of course, you had the hacking and leaking of emails from the Democratic National Committee and other things um, which, you know, uh, were supposed to, again, tilt people in favor of Donald Trump. And we know that when his, he was elected four years ago, they opened the champagne bottles in Moscow. So they were very hopeful. And then, of course, President Trump came up <laughs> against the unpleasant reality that because of the knowledge of what Russia had done in the 2016 election, and because the intelligence agencies all agreed and they documented in a report that there was a, then partly declassified so that everyone could read it, exactly what the Russians had done, both in terms of manipulating social media and actual cyber interference. And so President Trump was unable to implement the kind of policies he wanted because the knowledge of what Russia did in 2016 has made Russia a very toxic subject. It hasn't been such a toxic domestic subject in the United States since I think the era of Senator Joseph McCarthy. Um, it's very hard to have often a reasoned debate about Russia because of this. And many people in the Democratic Party believe that President Trump was not legitimately elected four years ago uh, because the Russians put him in power. I don't agree with that. I think that's an exaggeration. I would also point out, and maybe we can get into that in the Q&A, that this year there has been much less Russian interference. There's been Russian social media interference, and I think some penetration of, of voter records, but it's markedly less than it was four years ago. So then you have to ask, what did the Trump administration accomplish with Russia? And the answer is not very much. I'm going to go back to repeat what Elizabeth said. There is no Russia policy in the Trump administration. It's completely bifurcated. You have Donald Trump, who has his own views, who wanted to make a deal with Russia and have everything work out. And then you have the rest of the executive branch and the US Congress, who have been very tough on Russia. And almost from the beginning, the US Congress took away the ability of the president to impose or remove sanctions by executive order because they didn't trust President Trump. He would have liked to have gotten rid of all of the sanctions that were there after Ukraine. And so now it's all enshrined in congressional legislation, mounds and mounds of sanctions, and they're very hard to remove. So the policy is actually consisted of withdrawing from the agreement on intermediate range nuclear forces, um, and then not doing anything really to um, extend the New START agreement. This is the agreement that controls strategic nuclear weapons. We and the Russians between us possess 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. This is a very important agreement. The Trump administration argued, again, to come back to China, that they wouldn't make any deal with Russia. They wouldn't sign an extension of this agreement uh, unless Chinese nuclear weapons were included. The Chinese said, no, thank you very much. So this is an agreement that expires on February the 5th. There has been some last minute um, attempts by the Trump administration to come to an agreement with the Russians to extend it, um, but the Russians have rejected that. So we're now, it's a cliffhanger. If Biden wins, the administration would have two weeks to extend this agreement. Um, so there was some movement there. Then the other aspect of the policy, as I said, has been rafts of sanctions on Russia, uh, on Russian energy projects, um, and they, they continue there. Um, apart from that, most of the traditional channels of interaction really have been broken off. There were a couple of times when they met and talked about strategic stability. Trump and Putin had a couple of summits, the most infamous one being in 2018, when President Trump seemed to indicate that he believed Putin's denials of election interference uh, over the uh, conclusions of his own intelligence agency. So from the Russian point of view, Trump has been a disappointment. He wasn't able to deliver. 
the relationship, again, is worse than it's been really at any time since before 1985, um, uh, because in fact, what's happened is that Russian diplomats have been expelled and there have been these, um, these um, other economic sanctions on Russia. Now, very quickly, what might it look like going forward? If Trump were to be reelected, to be declared the winner, then of course, I think what you'd see is the continued decline of professional diplomacy, which has happened under the Trump administration. I mean, the State Department has really been uh, neutered in many ways and, um, and unable to carry out the normal functions of diplomacy. That would continue, and therefore you maybe wouldn't have a bifurcation between Trump's own policies and that of the rest of the executive branch. Let's assume the same would be true uh, for the Pentagon, let, for instance. And so he might be able to do more, but it's unclear exactly how much he could do. As long as Congress um, you know, holds the key to uh, lifting or increasing the sanctions, there, you know, there's a limit to what he can do. Um, if you had a Biden administration, and we can go into more detail on this, um, I think it would be different. You would have the restoration of traditional diplomacy, uh, you have professional diplomacy, you'd have the uh, restoration of different channels of communication between different government agencies and their um, counterparts in Russia. You would definitely have uh, an extension of the New START Treaty uh, and then discussions about further arms control. And then you could have a host of other areas where the US might could work with Russia um, on climate, because obviously you'd have a different climate policy um, under a Biden administration. On global health, again, uh, if the US were willing to rejoin the World Health Organization, and we could certainly work with Russia. We, Russia has the fourth largest number of COVID cases. So we're both very, very high up there. Um, on the other hand, you probably would have an emphasis um, in a Biden administration on the pursuit of human rights, the support of human rights and uh, democracy programs in Russia, which is something that of course has been absent in the Trump administration. And of course the Russians wouldn't like that. And I think there would be a review of some of the sanctions, but we don't know whether they would continue them or somehow modify them. So the relationship I think with Russia would be different. Having said that, US-Russian relations don't change that much between administrations, just because the issues that one has to deal with don't go away. They're very similar issues over the past 30 years. The aberration really has been in the Trump administration where you've had a president who really wanted to change the rules. Um, I would end by saying, um, again, referring to something that Elizabeth was talking about too. I think Trump and Putin in many ways share a similar worldview. And that is that allies constrain uh, that absolute sovereignty is really very important and that smaller countries have less, so less sovereignty than big ones. Um, uh, and so I'll, I'll end there. Great, thanks for that, Angela. Um, Elizabeth, Angela has kind of looked forward there to what things might look like in the future. And I know at least one US network is now referring to Joe Biden as the president-elect. So you might tell us um, what you think uh, U.S.-China relations might look like under a Biden administration. Sure, um, I have to take a moment to be emotional. Okay, so <laughs> um, I guess, uh, you know, what would be this truly substantive difference? Um, I think there would be a toning down of the anti-China rhetoric. Uh, I think there would be an effort to have a strategic objective, to have an end point uh, in mind for what the US would like the relationship with uh, China to look like. So it wouldn't just be a constant pushing back across the board, you know, with many, you know, different initiatives. Um, I think there would be clearly, uh, as, you know, Angela suggested, uh, a renewed emphasis on diplomacy and, um, and professionalism in terms of our relations with allies. We're not going to be launching, you know, a tariff war in Europe at the same time as we're trying to do something in China. Uh, there'd be a step back and I think a look at uh, what the tariff war with China has accomplished or hasn't accomplished. And I think by uh, all of the sort of analyses that have been done have indicated that the US has suffered as a result and has gained nothing. So I think after a careful and close look at all of those tariffs, there would probably be a pulling back uh, in many cases um, because it clearly has not achieved the result uh, that the Trump administration you know, promised uh, that it would. Um, 
and again, I think there would be an effort to find areas of common ground and common purpose. So I think on climate change, on pandemic, um, you know, perhaps working on global public health in third countries, there would be that sense that the Obama administration had that uh, it's important to find areas of uh, engagement uh, with China. Having said that, um, I don't think there would be the same Obama era uh, policy where we would be willing to trade off. So in a sense, maybe pull back on the South China Sea in order to gain something uh, on, um, on climate change. I think there's been a, a learning curve uh, in terms of the fact that uh, China will simply take advantage of that. You know, uh, Xi Jinping stood in the Rose Garden and promised that he was not going to uh, militarize these uh, seven artificial features that he had uh, created, and then he went and did it. Uh, so th that lack of trust, I think, uh, in the US-China relationship will continue. Uh, I don't see that being bridged anytime soon uh, on the part of the United States. Um, but I think, again, there, there'll be an effort to, to arrest this free fall. Um, but I don't think, so let me just conclude by saying, I don't think that the overall orientation of the United States toward China, the overall understanding of the challenges that China presents to the United States, I don't see a significant shift in, in that element of US-China policy. Okay, thanks, Elizabeth. Michelle, you might outline for us what you think things might look like under, as I say, he's now being referred to as President-elect Joe Biden. Uh, well, one thing I want to point out, Katrina, is that we're not going to know for a while what the balance in the U.S. Senate is. So um, assuming we have a President Biden, it's not clear whether he will have uh, congressional majorities to work with. And that, that is gonna affect some of the policies on the Middle East, right? And we have, I believe we have four Senate seats that have still not been decided. Two of them look likely to go to runoffs into January. Um, I would say the Democrats have a shot at three out of four of those seats, but they need to capture at least two of them and then have the vice president, uh, Kamala Harris, to, to have a voting majority, right? So we're not gonna, we're not gonna know uh, exactly the policymaking climate that uh, Biden would have for a while. Now, there are a number of things that he can do just by, that Trump did by executive order and that Biden has already promised to change by executive order. Some of those are things I mentioned. For example, this Muslim ban on um, you know, access to the United States for people from those five countries. Uh, Biden has promised he will cancel that on day one. He's also promised that he would increase uh, the number of refugees accepted in the United States to 125,000 in his first year, which would be even more than President Obama accepted. So some of those things he can and will do right away. Um, on some of the other issues on Iran, of course, this is, would be one of the big changes would be you know, a Biden administration will want to get back into an agreement related to Iran's um, nuclear program. But um, again, depending on how the Senate comes out, you know, the Senate, uh, the, the Congress can constrain his ability a bit to, to lift sanctions and things like that. Although I would say that an administration always has a good deal of discretion on how to, how strictly to apply sanctions and so forth. So certainly Biden, there will be a, a disposition to get back into some kind of an agreement, certainly to work more closely with Europe on this issue and to consider some sanctions relief. Uh, on Israel as well, I don't, I don't think that Israel-Palestine is gonna be a major, um, priority for the Biden administration at this point, but but the, certainly the Biden administration would want to reverse some of Trump's policies. In other words, like um, reopen sort of ties with the Palestinians, maybe a Palestinian or PLO mission of some kind in the United States. He may push some face some pushback on things like that from the Senate if it's if if the Republicans have a majority there uh, on arms sales. But that, then let me mention there are a couple of things that I think even Senate Republicans would probably agree with uh, Biden on. This could be restricting arms sales. Uh, and and uh, particularly those that that might fuel the conflict uh, in Libya, I'm, I'm sorry, in Yemen and maybe Libya. We could talk about that separately. And this issue of human rights that um, some of the other panelists have mentioned. I actually do think that for the most part, Senate Republicans have wanted President Trump to do more on standing up for human rights in the Middle East, and that they would support Biden in that. So. Um, 
you know, th there are, uh, uh, you know, Biden has promised a couple of other things. He's promised a reassessment of the US relationship with Saudi Arabia. We don't know exactly what that means or where it will go. There's some very, very big questions there. And then there's the, the overall issue of how the United States kind of reduces its involvement in the Middle East, you know, militarily at least. Uh, and that, that's going to be a very hard question. Um, and um, I think that, you know, it would be, it, it, if the Republicans hold the Senate, it would be really important for a Biden administration to, to work out something with, with Senate Republicans on how to do that. And also, you know, to work with our allies in Europe or in around the world. I think, you know, a Biden administration is not doesn't want to rock the boat in the Middle East, doesn't want to destabilize, doesn't want to create vacuums. They've seen the problems that can come from creating power vacuums. But they're, they have, they're going to have a lot of hard, hard questions to face. And let me just say, Katrina, Middle East is a place that's in turmoil. It's going to be in turmoil. The whole political economic basis of the Middle East, oil, as we know, is changing as world energy markets change. And that is going to bring... Um, I believe more popular uprisings, more changes in governments. And I think that's going to present the next U.S. administration uh, with, with a lot of challenges as, as to, you know, as the United States wants to withdraw from this area of the world and devote more time, for example, to Asia, how do they do that while the Middle East itself is sort of coming apart at the seams? Okay, and just to bring you another news update, that network that had decided to call President Biden president, or sorry, Vice President Biden president-elect, has now said that Pennsylvania, although Biden is in the lead, is too close to call. So we're still at that anyone can win stage of this count. So just to keep the drama going for a bit longer this afternoon. Um, now you've all agreed there though, that if um, Joe Biden is the next president, that he will recommit the US to the international order to, to kind of reestablishing its place in the world. Um, and I'm just wondering, Angela, what do you think that might mean for a Russia-China cooperation? Will they seek to sort of counterbalance a resurgent United States? So, Russia and China clearly have been growing closer and closer in the last few years, particularly since 2014, just as relations with the West deteriorated, the Chinese stepped in, uh, they signed a major um, gas deal with the Russians, and they really backed the Russians at a time when the US and the Europeans were seeking to isolate uh, Russia. So this has been going on for some time. Um, and what we've seen as a result of the sanctions, for instance, or the dual policies of a trade war with China and more and more sanctions on Russia is that the Russians and Chinese, for instance, in, now they do more than 50% of their um, trade uh, in, in the non-dollar. In other words, the de-dollarization of their economic relationship. And so there's, there's a backstory there that obviously they are both looking to maybe create an international financial system which is not dominated by the US. We're not there yet. We're far from it. But you know, then they're both committed to what they call a post-Western um, global order. I think that means different things for Russia and for China. China understands it's the rising power. Um, it doesn't really believe, I mean, the Russians believe that you should have a tripolar daughter, if you like, running the world. The US, China, Russia, they each have their spheres of influence and um, they don't interfere with each other. I think the Chinese don't believe there's going to be such a world. They believe there's going to be, you know, a, a, a bipolar world, if you like, China and the US, but they don't put Russia in the same category. But they don't, nobody talks about that publicly. So for the moment, you have an increasing strategic relationship. A couple of weeks ago, Putin was asked about whether Russia might have a military alliance with China. Um, and he said at the moment, no, but, you know, he could, he could see that happening in the future. And so I, and, and Russia has been trying to position itself um, in, the, in the COVID era as a leader in global health, a leader in the World Health Organization. It of course announced its vaccine before the Chinese did. Russia and China both now have a vaccine that their own populations are taking. So I think they would be rather wary of the specter of a Biden administration of the US coming back and seeking to reprise the role that the US really was playing before Trump was elected, um, although it will be difficult to do that soon. So I think from their point of view, they were quite you know, happy to see 
a, a, a United States become more isolationist and less involved in world affairs. So I think, you know, the US, as was already mentioned, has defined Russia and China as the two major, major strategic competitors of the United States. And I think, um, I think you would see Russia and China, yes, continue to work close, more closely together and seeking to ensure maybe that the US doesn't um, achieve, uh, you know, the status that it had before, although it's not going to be easy for them to do that. Okay, Elizabeth, do you want to row in on that one? Sorry, sure. Um, now, I agree with what Angela said. I just, I was smiling because, um, you know, often when I'm in, in China, they talk about the Russians. It's, it's become uh, like, you know, the Russians are kind of the, the second, the little brother or something. They're the second tier player. And that is the way that China looks at Russia. So formally, you're never, you'll never hear Xi Jinping say that. In fact, on a couple of occasions, he has said that uh, Putin is his best friend, literally his best friend in the international um, community. So sometimes early on in the Trump administration, I wanted to go and let Donald Trump know that because, you know, he used to say that Xi Jinping was his best friend. I was like, nah, actually, she thinks Putin's his best friend. So, uh, you know, in that world of autocratic uh, leaders. Um, but but I do think it's, um, I think it's, the relationship is likely to undergo some stress. And I think um, as China increasingly challenges Russia in some areas where Russia has been more dominant, for example, as an arms, a leader in innovation in arms an exporter of arms and China itself begins to be more innovative in that sector and becomes a larger exporter of arms. I think that's problematic. There was that, I'm sure Angela knows that little incident where the Russians believe that the Chinese were stealing some of their military technology. That's, I think, a, a potential problem. You know, I don't know for sure, and I'd be interested in, in Michelle's take on this, whether or not um, China's rise in the Middle East might pose some issues for Russia, because China's been content always to be an economic player, right? It gets all the spoils and, and none of the risks of being the, the military uh, engager. But I'm not sure that China's gonna be content. And they've, they've made a few forays into trying to negotiate Middle East peace here or there, and not, not with any real success, but, but I just see them stepping up in ways that, that might threaten some of Russia's traditional roles. Then finally, maybe in the Arctic. And, and that's an area where the two have been working together. But again, I'm not sure that Russia would really welcome China, from my perspective, is trying to change the, the notion of Arctic governance to make it about the global commons. So it's no longer governed just by the countries that, you know, border the Arctic, uh, even though China is 900 miles away. So it's really an Arctic country, but it likes to call itself a, you know, near polar power. Um, so I think it's trying to change the definition of the Arctic um, in ways that, and the issues of the Arctic that would allow it to play a larger role and a role equal to that of Russia, the United States and, and the others on the Arctic uh, governance, the governance board. I'm not sure whether Russia would welcome that. Um, you know, I think it, it wants to maintain some element of leadership uh, in some of these institutions where it's not being elbowed aside by China. I mean, I would defer to Angela on that, but as I'm watching China, I just, I feel like Russia should be wary of this sort of creeping uh, Chinese influence, presence, and ambition. Can I say something about oh, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think those are all very important points. So, I mean, Putin has made the decision clearly in the last few years that he would rather be, if he's going to be a junior partner to either the US or China, he's accepted that Russia is now the junior partner to China again. Although, as you say, both of them say, or oh, Xi Jinping says Putin's his best friend. I have a picture in my book of the two of them making blini, Russian pancakes together. Putin's teaching Xi how to make pancakes. And then um, uh, Xi was apparently given some special Russian ice cream in one of his recent birthdays and things like that. So there's this eloquent, you know, over the top praise of each other that you see publicly, but the reality is different. So I think in the Arctic, it's a very important area. Russia really thinks that you know, it wants to dominate and control the Arctic. Um, it's got this new Arctic strategy, we'll see whether it's ever implemented, but where both economically, militarily, geopolitically, it wants to be the number one country there. Um, the Chinese have come in and they have this polar Silk Road now, which they're discussing or implementing with the Russians, and they are working on some energy projects but actually the Chinese don't have the technology that the Russians need. The US has that. And because of the sanctions, Exxon had to pull out of this project there. Um, but I do think that, that in the longer run, and this is true in a number of different areas, China will challenge Russia 
um, and it'll be very difficult for Russia to push back on this challenge. Another area is clearly Central Asia. Uh, the whole Belt and Road project, there's nothing in it for Russia, despite what you read and what the Chinese say. Um, so I think in the longer run, China is a much greater challenge for Russia, but in the short run, and I think the Russian leadership isn't thinking about the longer run, uh, China is at the moment a much more congenial partner than the United States. Okay, thanks Angela. Michelle, Elizabeth mentioned there about China weighing into Middle East and that US Middle Eastern involvement. Would you want to make some remarks on that? Yes, just on this issue of Russia and China in the Middle East, you know, up till now, we see them playing different roles. I mean, Russia obviously has become very involved militarily um, in Syria and, and now in Libya. Um, it has tried to, it's, it has cultivated a bit of a, a military relationship with Egypt and uh, tried to do more there. China, though, of course, is, you know, is getting more and more involved economically. And I just want to point out that both of these have caused problems or tensions between the United States and some of its allies. Uh, one of the things that either uh, a Biden or a Trump administration will face is this issue of whether to impose sanctions. These, these CATSA, Countering America's Adversaries Through Sanctions Act, these CATSA sanctions against um, countries that buy Russian weapons. So the, the two that are you know, really important here are Turkey and Egypt. Turkey having bought um, the Russian air defense system in Egypt, having bought uh, some Russian fighter aircraft. Uh, and these are, of course, you know, Turkey and NATO ally, Egypt, a long time military ally of the United States. Turkey's actually taken delivery of that equipment and sanctions are, I, I think, expected to be imposed. Egypt hasn't taken delivery of the aircraft yet, but they're ready to go. And, you know, that could, so that's gonna be, you know, that's something where I think the United States is trying to push back. Uh, on 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 Russia, um, and then the other the other issue is China economically. And I would say, you know, we've seen the Trump administration has started to try to push back on China in terms of technology, in terms of five G, going around to U.S. allies um, in in the Middle East and trying to persuade them either to to not not work with. Huawei, for example, on 5G. Uh, and one of the big issues there, though, I think is Israel, because Israel has extensive, you know, economic, technological uh, cooperation with China. And, um, you know, I, I think Israel is going to resist, you know, U.S. efforts. Uh, the U.S. will be persistent in trying to limit economic ties and te technology transfer and so forth between between Israel and China. But that's a major part of sort of Israel's economic plan. And I think they're going to uh, they're going to resist. Okay, thanks for that, Michelle. Um, and just to remind everyone, if you do have any questions for our panelists, use the Q&A function on Zoom. There we have a number of questions in already, which we'll get to in just a moment, but um, you can use that function. And remember, do include your name and your affiliation because we can't see you, even though you can see us. And um, now this is obviously hosted by the Institute for International and European Affairs. So we might try and bring a European dimension into some of what we're discussing here at the moment. And Michelle, you were just talking there about Russia and China in the Middle East, but do you see the US leaning on Europe in the future to take more responsibility in the Middle East? Well, so uh, uh, some things I think will change if there is a Biden administration um, and some things will not. What I think will probably not change is, you know, the continued US effort to, you know, persuade European allies to, to spend you know, two percent on defense and so forth. I think that that's probably going to go on. Um, certainly, you know, a Biden administration will, uh, you know, take a much more cooperative um, and and uh, approach, and you know, with the, the uh, with Europe in the Middle East. But I, I, as I said, I do. I think there was going to be um, there will be some tension, perhaps, over Israel Palestine issues. Uh, although the Biden administration will be a little bit, you know, will take a, a, a somewhat 
softer and more sympathetic approach to Palestinians than the very rough approach that Donald Trump took, it's still probably not going to be um, as, as critical of Israel and settlements and so forth as, as European allies would like. So there'll be some, you know, there'll be some discussion on that. Um, and uh, yeah, there will be a lot more cooperation, you know, on Iran. But one issue that I want to point out that it could be, we'll see where the Biden administration will go on this. You know, the, some of the top arms purchasers in the world are in the Middle East. Um, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, you know, have been among the among the top four arms purchasers in the world. And who's competing for those arms sales? We are. United States and our European allies. Yes, Russia and China sell them some arms, but it's mostly us, right? And we are competing with each other. And frankly, we are fueling wars in the Middle East by competing with each other for these arms sales. So the question will be, you know, will the Biden administration, uh, if there is one, tr take a different approach to that? I think, you know, with this, I haven't even mentioned this recent uh, normalization between the United Arab Emirates and Israel, which is a very important development. Um, and but but the 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 cost of that was that the Trump administration promised these fighter aircraft, these F thirty five, very advanced fighter aircraft, to the UAE uh, as part of that deal. And we'll see whether that will go forward. That's a kind of a long process in the United States to carry out uh, an arms sale like that. But if it does go forward, this is going to kick off a new arms race in the Middle East. Israel's already put in its shopping list to maintain its qualitative military. Edge. Edge. And then others who wanted those aircraft, like Egypt, like Turkey, are going to be upset that the UAE got them. So as I said, new arms race. I do think a Biden versus a Trump administration will take different approaches to that. I think from a, from a Trump point of view, an arms race is fantastic. Just more sales and, you know, so forth. And, and really no, no thought to the humanitarian consequences of that. I think we've already seen from, from Democrats and from Biden that they're a little troubled by this you know, by, by, by fueling this arms race in the Middle East. And so we might see, you know, an attempt to, to reel that in a bit and an attempt for the United States to have a uh, conversation with some of its European allies, particularly uh, France, Germany, Italy, UK, who are selling a lot of arms to the Middle East. You know, could we, can we all work together to, to rationalize this somehow? Elizabeth, we're talking there about the EU-US relationship in relation to the Middle East, but what about China? Um, I'm thinking, you know, how does a partnership like that balance the economic ties and that element of the relationship with China with calling out the human rights abuses, of, particularly on thinking of the Uyghur population? So I, I would say over the past um, three and a half years, um, you know, again, I, I I spoke at the outset about how the Trump administration reassessed China policy in a fairly dramatic way. I think that there's also been a, a rethink in Europe uh, that has evolved over the past few years. Uh, and it's a, a rethink that has brought it not to the point of the United States, but frankly, much closer to the point of the United States. And part of that, I think um, the United States did play the role of you know, a, a wake up call uh, in some respects. I think alerting Europe, for example, to the potential uh, downsides of, you know, Huawei and your critical uh, telecommunications infrastructure. Uh, and we've seen, you know, one country after the other in Europe um, move uh, to restrict Huawei uh, or to ban it outright or try to do it in some kind of regulatory framework that doesn't make it sound like they're banning it, but they really are. Um, you know, how, how to balance these things. I think, um, uh, <laughs> you know, Europe and the United States have, have come together already on issues like Xinjiang, uh, on Hong Kong. They stepped up, they've put forward resolutions in the United Nations. Um, you know, the US has levied sanctions on officials um, that are uh, responsible, what we deem to be responsible for uh, uh, the detention and, and um, the labor and re-education camps in Xinjiang. I think there are discussions in Europe about whether there are more measures uh, that some could take uh, along those lines. Should they be enacting some kinds of sanctions uh, in this regard? You know, there's an interparliamentary alliance that's developed um, that includes legislators in the United States, in Europe, um, and some in Asia, all of whom are committed 
to a, a much stronger, tougher policy on China. It's been fascinating uh, to watch it evolve. Uh, I think on the security front, I think if you look at the supranational organizations, the, the EU Commission and, the, um, and NATO, they are both very assertive when it comes to China. Uh, very much more, uh, you know, very much closer to a U.S. position than some of the independent countries uh, within the EU. So I think there are a lot of pressures, frankly, that are um, acting upon uh, European nations uh, to move them in a direction that will be tougher, uh, that will force tougher choices when it comes to uh, that trade-off between trade and, and human rights. And I think, you know, one of the big and last holdouts, Angela Merkel, right, just recently indicated like, okay, actually I'm beginning to see, or she's getting a lot of pressure to see uh, that China is not a benign actor uh, and that the way that China conducts itself in Hong Kong or it's you know, mass diplomacy, it's wolf warrior mass diplomacy, it's coercive actions in Australia, all of these things combine to present a picture of a China um, that is much more challenging uh, than I think uh, some European nations initially understood or that they wanted to recognize, right? And you want to think I can just keep doing business uh, and at the same time, you know, sort of push off these other kinds of issues. So I think there's a, a shift underway in Europe in the understanding of China um, that's going to lead them to a tougher approach. Having said that, uh, and I, oh, sorry, let me also say, I think some of Xi Jinping's policies, for example, the dual circulation uh, theory, which really is about uh, maintaining a much more closed circle of uh, innovation and manufacturing and consumption, so much more insular economic policy. I think that will add uh, to the uh, impetus, you know, frankly, for Europe to to move in a tougher uh, direction. But look, they're going to continue to push forward with, you know, trying to strike, you know, investment treaty, uh, you move forward in free trade uh, areas. So I think um, that's all going to continue. Uh, but I do think there's um, a greater realization in Europe of the whole package that China presents uh, and um, many of the, the longer term uh, issues that need to be thought about now uh, before, you know, it's too late. Hey, thanks, Elizabeth. And Angela, you've written that one of the most pressing challenges for the next U.S. administration is going to be Russia's conflict in Ukraine. How do you see that playing out? Sure, and I, I think we can bring Europe into this. So, I mean, one thing that you can say is in the Obama administration, there was close coordination with Europe over the sanctions uh, on Ukraine and over Western policy toward Ukraine. And it was particularly Chancellor Merkel and President Obama who worked together. Uh, we know that in the Trump administration, Angela Merkel has been almost demonized. Um, there's been a, a lot of anti-German feeling and policy expressed by uh, the president himself and some of the people around him. And so the kind of cooperation on working together on Russia and Ru Russian related issues really disappeared. Now, as far as Ukraine's concerned, clearly um, it's France and Germany and then Russia and uh, Ukraine within the Normandy format that have been working together um, to try and implement the 2015 Minsk agreements that are supposed to end this conflict. Um, at the beginning of the Trump administration, we had a special envoy for Ukraine, and then all of that got caught up in the impeachment hearings. It's hard to believe that, you know, a year ago we were gearing up for impeachment hearings, which of course happened uh, in January. And since then, uh, because of everything connected with the impeachment and the relationship with President Zelensky, um, uh, the U.S., you know, we don't have a special envoy anymore. We obviously have people who are still working on it in the State Department, but we don't have that level of a person. So I think in a Biden administration, they will reappoint someone who will take charge of this. Uh, we need to work more closely with the Europeans. Um, so far, they haven't wanted us in this Normandy format. Maybe we won't be. At least we need to work more closely with them. But having said that, unfortunately, these Minsk agreements haven't been implemented barely because the Russians and Ukrainians have a very different understanding of what their implementation means, and particularly the sequencing. Uh, the Ukrainians think the Russians should withdraw to behind the border, um, and, and then they can start negotiating things. The Russians say they're not going to withdraw their troops until the Ukrainians allow elections in the, the two uh, republics that have been set up in southeastern Ukraine. Um, there's been some prisoner exchange, um, but not enough. Uh, in the beginning of Zelensky's tenure in office, it looked as if something might move, but we're really stuck, we're frozen. So I think going forward, the question is, um, do you need something to replace the Minsk agreements? 
Uh, and if so, what would that be? And so far, nobody's come up uh, with, a, with a good solution to that. Uh, and if not, is there any other way to move forward on this? Um, because it's, you know, I say it's a frozen conflict, but as I said at the beginning, people are still dying there. So it's quite intractable. Um, and it doesn't, you know, there's very little sign that the Russians want to move ahead. And I think the current Ukrainian government um, really doesn't, is a little bit stuck in terms of knowing what, what to do going forward. Okay, thank you all for those contributions. We've got a lot of questions from um, people who have tuned in. So we'll go switch over to a couple of those. The first one comes, Michelle, from an old colleague of yours in Cairo, Peter Gunning. And uh, he says, great panel, um, which I agree, it is a great panel. Well done uh, to all of you. What is the outlook for the State Department in resources, personnel and morale under both scenarios, either a Biden or Trump administration. And we have a similar question to that from Noel Fahey, who's a former ambassador to the US. And he's saying, if Joe Biden does win, is it too much to expect that the loss of professional expertise in recent years can be easily or quickly restored? And you all had touched on that in your initial contributions about that sort of shrinking of the State Department. So, um, Michelle, as this com primarily comes from a former colleague of yours, you might kick off that. Um, yes, look, so let me just say, you know, should President Trump uh, have a second term? Um, first of all, we don't know if, um, if Secretary Pompeo would continue as Secretary of State, it would be typical. Um, and we, we've heard rumblings already that if, if Trump continues, he would uh, do a, a pretty big cabinet change. So, um, you know, it, there, it, there can be a, a little bit or better or a little bit worse situation inside the State Department under Trump, depending on who is Secretary of State. But, but I think, you know, if Trump can, were to continue, you know, we continue to see diplomacy very much um, uh, uh, troubled. And, and, and in fact, Trump took a recent step regarding um, civil servants that uh, sort of politicizing, you know, making making civil servants uh, within within the State Department more subject to kind of political pressure and so forth. I don't want to go into details, but it's a dark situation for the State Department if Trump has a second term. Um, if Biden, you know, is um, becomes president, then there certainly will be an energetic, I think, um, attempt to, to rebuild the State Department. I think there, there's already been some looking into whether, for example, people at sort of middle or senior ranks who left uh, under Trump could be you know, allowed to come back somehow. So this will be a big project. Uh, but but you know I think it will happen and certainly there would be a turnaround in morale. Um, you know we also don't know who would be Secretary of State under Biden. There's a short list of names. Uh, and again, to go back to the Senate, it does depend a little bit, I think, as to whether the Democrats have their majority in the Senate or, or they don't, the Republicans hold the majority, which of those candidates on Biden's short list would be most viable. But any of them, I think, would, you know, would undertake kind of the, the revival of diplomacy and the, the you know, rebuilding of the State Department. I think one of the names on that uh, short list is the Irish woman, Samantha Power, the former US ambassador to the UN. Uh, so there would be a particular interest probably in this country in her in her being appoint appointed if in fact, Joe Biden is the president after all the votes are cast. Um, Elizabeth, there's some questions in here relating to China from Tim Hagen, who says he's watching on YouTube. Now he's asking, what do you think about Chinese popular influence abroad or is it only a partnership of convenience and does any country want to copy Chinese world perspectives? What do you think of the spread of illiberal democracies, Chinese influence in our ally, allies like Turkey and is a new TPP possible? So lots to unpack there. <laughs> Wait, okay. Not sure where that last part just came in from the left. Well, let me start with the last one and then just take the first one. I think is a new TPP possible? I, I think there are definitely um, people within a potential Biden administration who would be interested in reviving TPP. I can say among you know the Asia, 
you know, group of, of people, there'd certainly be a lot of interest uh, because there's a belief that, you know, our strongest asset is working with our allies and having, being part of a high-end trade agreement um, uh, is important. It's important for U.S. leadership. Uh, it will be, frankly, a wash likely in terms of, uh, you know, what it will bring to the U.S. economy. Some, some jobs will be lost, some jobs will be gained. Uh, but as, as an assertion of, you know, the U.S. in the region, it's incredibly important. And it's also something that would re-engage uh, a notion of, you know, having China look outside itself and want to be part of something larger, uh, and then as a mechanism of again promoting some domestic reform in China in the way that the WTO did. So there's there would still be that uh, element of it. So I think there's a, a big group that would be for it, but of course there will be I think still um, a fair amount of opposition within parts of the Democratic Party uh, that would be very concerned around labor issues and loss of jobs. And so I think there'd be some negotiations that would have to be take place. And frankly, we'd have to we'd have to figure out our way back in because the agreement's done, right? And it's it's operable now. And so how we manage to renegotiate is will be a, a pretty significant issue. Um, as to the issue of China's um, export of its model and concerns around um, the spread of uh, illiberal, um, uh, you know, sort of authoritarian uh, countries, um, you know, is China exporting elements of its uh, model? This is another big debate. I didn't mention this one. This is another big debate in the United States. And, and I fall down on the side that yes, indeed it is uh, exporting elements of authoritarianism. And it's, you know, doing it in part through the Belt and Road, you know, offering cyber, you know, training uh, seminars to Belt and Road uh, countries on how to manage the internet, how to control the media and civil society. Um, it is, uh, you know, pushing for changes in norms within the United States around human rights, around internet governance. Um, so I very much see China as uh, advancing or buttressing, uh, you know, its own, uh, its own model uh, abroad, right, and trying to ensure that norms and values as they're expressed in the international system align more closely with those of China. Some people say this is simply a defensive mechanism, right, that China is just trying to make the world safe for itself. But in doing that, you are essentially undermining the liberal international order. So, you know, the best, uh, you know, uh, defense is a good offense. And, and that's how I look at, at uh, China's uh, efforts. Did I address all the, the elements of that, I think? Uh, yeah, I think you did there, yeah. Um, you mentioned Belt and Road Initiative there, and there is a question in on that. I don't know, um, Angela, if you maybe want to take this one, or, or Elizabeth or Michelle. Uh, this is from James Kitt. He's saying, what role do the panelists believe the role of international development, particularly in the African content, continent, will have on the dynamics of foreign relations between US, Russia, China, etc.? i.e. will we see the US using foreign aid to check the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative in East Africa? Um, I can definitely say something. We have done, actually, we have um, begun the process of responding uh, in a more than just rhetorical way uh, to the Belt and Road. Um, so the Congress has taken the lead on this um, through the Asia Reassurance Initiative Act and the BUILD Act. We've constructed an entirely new institution called the Development Finance Corporation uh, that is devoted to um, providing financing uh, for infrastructure projects in uh, lesser developed countries. And this is you know, directly targeted at uh, competing with uh, China on the Belt and Road Initiative. We have uh, an, a joint effort with the um, Japanese and the Australians uh, to undertake partnerships uh, in infrastructure. And we have what's called the Blue Dot Initiative, which is a kind of um, certificate, sort of a certification process, right? Or providing advice and consulting services to countries that might be interested in having potential projects reviewed uh, to see whether they are in fact sustainable, sustainable in the context of, you know, social development or environment, or uh, certainly in terms of debt sustainability, which has been a big issue for uh, the Trump administration. So I think um, we're nowhere uh, really, in terms of actually competing, I would say these are baby steps, they're important. Um, I think what's interesting is that many other countries are also energized around this. This is not simply an issue of the US and China. Japan is very uh, engaged. Um, Europe is becoming uh, more engaged because they're concerned about uh, the 17 plus one initiative and, and Chinese influence within uh, Europe and some of the Central and Southern European countries in particular with the Belt and Road. So I think that there's uh, an awakening, especially with the digital Silk Road, 
you know, because that deals with fiber optic cables, satellite systems, you know, and, and e-commerce, and these things that will get embedded, you know, for the rest of the century uh, in terms of Chinese standards and, and Chinese influence, I think that there is growing concern and interest um, in, in much of, uh, you know, the advanced economies over China's, uh, you know, spreading influence. So, you know, it remains to be seen how much we can actually do. Uh, I'll make one last point on this, and that is sometimes it's important to look at the actual level of investment because people will be surprised to know that the largest investor in Southeast Asia is Europe, and the second is Japan, and third is China and US, they go back and forth. Largest in Africa is the United States. So China's like fifth. So sometimes these things get a little bit overblown, uh, but China is doing a lot in infrastructure, and that's, and that's what this is really all about. Angela, do you want to, to weigh in there on sort of international development and emerging economies and, and Russia's role in that? Um, I think I'll take a pass on that. Okay. Right. Well, we have another question here from Michelle, and this is from Valerie Hughes, member of the Irish Syria Solidarity Movement. And she says, if, the, if there is a new Biden administration, um, what lessons have been learned regarding Syria from the Obama days? Yes. Um, well, obviously, you know, what, what the, the terrible tragedy that has unfolded in Syria has been, uh, you know, a, a searing one. And uh, I think it's, it's one that the people from the Obama administration are still a bit arguing with themselves over, okay? As we know, during the Obama administration, there was a camp that wanted the United States to somehow do more uh, in Syria, although although short of a, a military intervention, wanted to do more to support the Syrian opposition and perhaps to work with Turkey or others to create safe zones and so forth. And then there were those who didn't want to do that, including President Obama himself, and that, that camp won out. So the, I think there's still a bit of an argument going on about could the situation in Syria have turned out any better um, had, had the United States worked more effectively with allies, be it in Europe, Turkey, et cetera, uh, or, or was there no help for it, that, that it was going to be as bad as it has been and um, the United States was wise to keep its hands off it as much as it could. Of course, there is US military involvement in Syria because of the campaign against the so-called Islamic State. So I, I, you know, I, I think that one hasn't been quite, quite resolved. I would say, you know, that there isn't, uh, there, there certainly is not an appetite for the United States to become more involved now. You know, there's an ongoing debate about how much involvement the United States should have to ensure that the so-called Islamic State doesn't, doesn't reemerge in a big way in Syria, you know, and become a global terrorist threat once again. So, um, you know, uh, but I, I think, you know, just the, the app, certainly the appetite for American military interventions, military involvement overall in the region is low. Uh, there, there may be an appetite for a more effective American military uh, uh, diplomatic role. What I would say is if we look at sort of the three burning conflicts in the Middle East right now, Syria, Libya, and Yemen. It's the last one, Yemen, that I believe the uh, people in the Biden camp, you know, think is most amenable to international diplomacy and American involvement to uh, to resolve that one, to wind that one down. Sadly, you know, the 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 uh, the conflict in Libya has just become more and more complicated with more and more international players. And Syria, I think, you know, is is um, you know, you know, look, we'll see what will happen politically inside of Syria. Um, you know, there are questions about the fortunes of Bashar al-Assad. I will say this: that I think if there's a President Biden, there will be a different American uh, approach. You know, should some of these things break in the Middle East, and should there be should there be future possibilities, but not, of course, for military intervention. Okay, thanks. Um, Angela, I'm not sure if you want to get engaged with that from a Russian perspective, and we also sure. have... 
Sure. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, uh, one of the ways, you know, I said that one of the ways that Russia got out of the isolation that the West was trying to impose on it after 2014 was to move closer to China. And the other, of course, was to go back to the Middle East in a way that it hadn't been since the Soviet collapse by beginning its bombing campaign in Syria. So obviously the Russians are at the moment committed to see um, Bashar Assad prevail, um, to end the civil war. Uh, it's obviously much more difficult than maybe they thought it would be. They've now had some more conflicts with Turkey um, in the area which they had more or less worked out between them. Um, so they're backing him. That doesn't mean they're gonna back him forever. But the other thing that's important for Russia that um, by going into the conflict in Syria in the way they did in 2014, that was really their entree into the Middle East as a whole. Um, they've be, become much more influential there. Um, unlike in the Soviet times, it's very pragmatic. They don't, they're not choosing ideological sides. Obviously they're backing Assad, but otherwise they're the only major power there that has uh, good relations, cordial relations with Iran and other Shia groups with all of the Sunni states and with Israel. And obviously Russia's uh, two uh, newest partners in the Middle East are both US allies, Saudi Arabia uh, and Israel. One thing I didn't mention at the beginning is that one of the, you might say, successes of the Trump administration vis-a-vis -vis Russia, at least, was brokering an agreement uh, between Russia and Saudi Arabia earlier on this year in April after this oil war uh, between them. Um, and so the, the, the OPEC plus agreement now holds uh, for the moment. So I don't see Russia um, you know, it's it's not going to retreat from the Middle East. Um, I, if you look at what's happening in Syria, um, I think the problem for Russia could come, you know, after the civil war is over in terms of its relationship with Iran. Do Iran and Russia want the same things in a post-conflict Syria? Um, and I think that's not clear yet. Um, but certainly the Russians will do anything to push back against a greater involvement uh, by the US in Syria, which I wouldn't necessarily see coming. And they, you know, portrayed themselves as the ones who've been so successful in defeating, you know, what they call terrorism. And the other thing is, of course, um, at the height of the war there, um, the second largest foreign troop, troop, uh, group of fighters for the Islamic State did come from Russia, were Russian citizens or Central Asians working in Russia. So I see this is one of the major gains of the Putin uh, administration over the past, you know, five, 10 years is the return to the Middle East. And we have another question for you, Angela, as well. <laughs> and this one is from Dara Moriarty of the IIEA. And he's saying they recently held an event with representatives from Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova marking 10 years of the Eastern Partnership. Mm -hmm. What difference do you think a Biden administration, if Joe Biden is the next president, might bring to pushing and promoting that Eastern Partnership agenda? I think they're, they're much more committed to it, obviously, than the Trump administration is. Um, they, you know, they would, a Biden administration would pay more attention to Ukraine. I talked about that before. It would also, there are people who, around Biden who were very involved with Georgia earlier on, so they certainly want to support Georgia um, in, its, in its attempts to, uh, you know, shore up its independence, although it's, it's more complicated now. Um, so I think a Biden administration would be more supportive of the kind of activities that the Eastern Partnership has pursued and encouraging these neighbors of Russia uh, to remain independent and to pursue, uh, you know, whatever foreign policy um, path they want and to strengthen their own institutions of governance and transparency in the rule of law. Okay, thank you. This one is for Elizabeth from Patrick Paul Walsh in UCD. How does conflict over intellectual property square with the flows of Chinese students to American universities and interactions between academics in the top 30 universities in both countries? Hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a big issue in the United States now is, um, you know, how to remain open and remain open to Chinese students and not to assume that, you know, every Chinese student, graduate student working in a U.S. university lab is somehow there at the behest of, of the Chinese government and, you know, committed to uh, stealing intellectual property. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, on the one hand, we've made some uh, good strides uh, doing deeper investigations, for example, the FBI and uh, unearthing that, you know, some 
200 different uh, ostensible graduate students are actually sent by the People's Liberation Army. Uh, and so, you know, making sure that when uh, we do have, uh, you know, Chinese graduate students working in US labs that, uh, you know, they're not coming from the PLA, uh, I think is important. Uh, I think, you know, universities will need to make a determination about whether or not, you know, money that's coming from the Defense Department to do uh, sort of, um, you know, contract work in the high security areas, you know, perhaps that's not, shouldn't be open to foreign students uh, writ large. Um, you know, is that something that we ought to be uh, considering or should universities be just open places of research? You know, should they be taking Defense Department contracts uh, to begin with? And, and should we, you know, just, think in terms of that broader, um, you know, universe of scientific research. And, you know, we're all part of a, of a global effort, um, you know, to find a scientific uh, truth, uh, which is, I think, the way that many scientists um, approach it, not just in the United States, but everywhere. So I think this is an area of some significant debate and um, has yet to be fully resolved in the United States. Uh, but I imagine that a Biden administration would uh, take a, a, a lighter, more careful uh, approach. Um, I think the Trump administration, administration has reset uh, sort of the, the situation and now it's time to recalibrate a little bit and to, to try to figure out what the nuances of, of, a, of a policy ought to be. Okay, I'm conscious that we're approaching um, time here. So we have maybe one time for one last question. This is from Neve Garvey, the head of policy with Trocra. Thank you to the panelists for a really interesting discussion. My question is, as Ireland takes up a non-permanent seat on the UN Security Council with a campaign focus, including climate change as a driver of hunger and insecurity, what potential do the panelists see for a shift in US openness to see the Security Council act more robustly on the issue of climate security? Michelle, do you wanna jump in there first or, or Elizabeth, whichever? Sure, I, I can start. So, well, I mean, clearly we see that if Biden becomes president, then he completely, you know, reverses the uh, approach in the United States to climate change and and um, and also international institutions. But on climate change, you know, to be honest with you, th this may be the most important change that that uh, a, a Biden administration would bring in terms of not only the future of the United States, but the future of the world, you know. So that's I think it, it, it's certainly going to be different. Let me just say briefly in in uh, in the Middle East, this is, you know, becoming more and more of an issue in the Middle East. The Middle East is already one of the hottest, driest regions of the world. And we are seeing now, uh, we are seeing parts of the Middle East are going to become so hot as to be uninhabitable. And we're seeing most important water supplies um, diminish. And then we're seeing, um, it, you know, parts of parts of land become unarable. So food security. There, so there are already some big problems. We're seeing the possibility of a water war between Egypt and Ethiopia, for example. You know, so there are going to be some big security problems that are climate change related. And I do think a Biden administration will be much more willing to work with other players in the world, including the United Nations and other international institutions on these issues. Elizabeth, do you want to jump in on the UN Security Council sure. on climate? Sure. I, mean, I, I think I think Michelle's absolutely right. This is going to be a, a sea change uh, in terms of the US approach on, on climate change. And I would just point to the fact that it won't just be coming from the administration, but that you know, close to 70% of Americans, Republicans and Democrats, want the United States to be doing more on climate change, believe that this is one of the most important issues that we need to be addressing. So I think there's domestic you know, desire to do more. And then within the Democratic Party, one of the, the main areas of the, the platform is a Green New Deal. And to, to whatever extent the Biden, a Biden administration would decide to incorporate elements of that, it will incorporate elements of that. So I think the whole idea of the United States pushing forward in a really significant way at home, you know, on clean energy, I think it, you know, will, will and again, drive uh, an international policy on climate change that will be much more forward looking and, and responsive uh, to really addressing the issue. So extremely optimistic on that front for the United States if there's a Biden presidency. Okay, well, we're just uh, hitting time, so we'll leave it there. Lots to mull over as we all await the final outcome of this election while we're glued to the various news outlets and whatnot over the next while. Could be hours, could be days, who knows. But uh, thank you to Dr. Michelle Dunn, Dr. Elizabeth Economy and Dr. Angela Stent, who just had to leave a couple of minutes early there because she had another engagement to get to. But um, 
on behalf of everyone listening, ladies, thank you very much. That was absolutely fascinating discussion. And to everyone watching, thank you for joining us. Thank you.